Hi everyone, and welcome to Empowering the Opposition. Uh, my name is Lexi Wilson. Um, and my name is Dr. Nafi Salam, and our topic today will be just introducing what we are planning to accomplish with our podcast. Um, so our podcast is obviously named Empowering the Opposition, and it comes from the idea that uh, we may be strong in our values and we believe what we believe, but the opposition to our beliefs also has a great deal of credibility. And we want to create a space where we're able to talk about different topics in all different angles without necessarily taking sides, actually without taking sides at all, mm -hmm. uh, preferably. Um, and I guess to get it started, I'll start by saying that um, I've always had an issue with the words social justice because what does it mean in comparison to justice? Um, if you have to make the choice between justice and social justice, not saying that you might have to necessarily, would you choose social justice because we're in that particular field or will we choose justice, justice, because that's what justice is? Same thing with political correctness versus correctness. Now this might be a little bit um, easier to communicate, but there, there are topics that are politically correct but aren't factually correct so do we err on the side of actual correctness or do we err on the side of political correctness um and we just want to create a space where we can just have these conversations and understand that you know th there are no right answers in fact one of my old professors once said the answer to every question is it depends mm -hmm. you're welcome here's your degree <laughs> right? yeah um, yeah, I would just like to add to that. I think um, right now, especially, we are living in a time where things are so divisive that, you know, there's black and white, you're right, you're wrong. And, and that a lot of times, you know, we really do live in this gray world. And um, I think there's a lot to be said for just hearing people out and listening to them, understanding why they think the way they do, understanding their background. Um, and listening with an open mind um, and an open heart. I, I know myself much like everyone else. Um, at times, you know, I can react emotionally sometimes to what people think or what people say, but, um, you know, we just have to understand that everyone comes from a unique, unique place and background in life. And I think there's a lot of beauty in exploring why people think the way they do, right? Honoring different cultures, different ways of life. Um, and not saying that, you know, one, right, one way is more right or um, wrong than the other, but to just be able to listen with an open mind and an open um, heart. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, let's talk quickly about what we do um, mm -hmm. and, and why this is important uh, to cover. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor, tenure track with Boise State University. Lexi, you are? Um, I um, just recently graduated with my master's degree in social work. I'm a licensed master social worker in the state of Idaho, and I also work for Boise State. Um, I'm a research associate for um, a large National Institute of Mental Health grant. Um, and so, yeah, we both kind of enjoy research and um, enjoy talking about these kind of topics. Yeah, and obviously we have uh, some reach in regards to students and, and our communities. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the ideas that we had for this particular podcast was just to, was just to create an, a space where people feel comfortable, you know, exploring different ideas without feeling mm -hmm. like they're abandoning their own values, mm -hmm. you know, so... Um, I mean, with that being said, I mean, we can get started talking about some, some topics just as an overview, for example. Um, just from my background in education, what I've noticed is that um, it's going more and more toward indoctrination. So part of the reason I became or chose to go into this arena is to battle this trajectory this this uh that, that education has been going where it's becoming more and more about indoctrination so my philosophy on education has always been to help my students and help my community understand how to think for themselves um versus uh, you know some of uh the people that i've worked with in the past uh you know not everyone of course in fact the greater majority it's been a pleasure to work with but there have been some who have said that you know we want our students to graduate 
all thinking the same thing. We want to teach them what to think, not how to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from that overview standpoint, uh, I've seen education go from, I'm a little bit older than Lexi, of course. (laughs) So I've seen education go from being just about, you know, factuality and just like information um, to being what is almost like indoctrination in many ways. So my goal in education is to return education to what it used to be um, and you know not in every kind of way of course but uh, just to having education be truly education where you equip people with the tools to get to their own outcomes without you know determining Mm -hmm. the outcomes for them you ask um, not ask you you teach your students how to ask the right questions Mm -hmm. not how to arrive at the right answers because the answers are always going to change. They're always going to uh, differ from, from question to question, mm-hmm. point to point. And I think that really um, there's something to be said about, you know, critical thinking. You know, that's a word that has been passed around so much. And I mean, I just recently finished six years of college. So, you know, I've heard it, um, you know, year after year. And I've had a lot of time to really think about that and process, you know, what does it really mean to critically think, right? Um, if, you know, in certain classes or certain environments, um, critically thinking is only okay when you agree with the majority, Mm. right? As opposed to when a lot of times the majority thinks a specific thing in a certain area, and then you go a hundred miles and the majority in that area is going to think something entirely different. Um, so I think critical thinking for me is being able to entertain ideas um, without having to hold on to them, without, without having to attach emotion to them, but just coming at some of these topics with just curiosity and um, being able to stand up you know, for what, what you believe in or what others believe in without having to hold on to that concept or idea, right? And that can be a challenging thing especially when you know there's personal involvement or um, people that you know um, may think a certain way or you know hold certain views Um, but at the end of the day i firmly believe that there's much more in this world that brings us together than there is that separates us yeah and and i think that's sometimes very difficult for people to understand and you know i think we all struggle with that to some some extent and quite often, just not, even outside of education, we tend to get to a point where we always mm-hmm. are infatuated with winning, winning an argument, and we don't, you know, we don't really think to learn. Um, and you know, even when we know we're wrong, we're so invested in the fight <laughs> in being right, <laughs> right, that, that we fail to understand that. So I think that's where, like, the title of our podcast, "Empowering the Opposition," comes from. Actually. When, when I was thinking about some of the different titles, like Eight Mile is one of my favorite movies. Mm. I mean, it's probably a few years before Lexi was born. <laughs> Kidding. No, <laughs> she's not that young. But, uh, but Eight Mile with Eminem. Um, I mean, it's been out for a good now period of time. Now I have to look so. this up, everybody. Yeah, so, you know, it's been out for, for a, a little while. So, like, spoiler <laughs> alert if you haven't seen it. But like it's it's a movie with Eminem, uh, the rapper, and like the very last. Two thousand two. So I was I was seven. Okay, so I was seven. <laughs> so, and I was uh, already old. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was just graduating high school. Two thousand two thousand two. No, I was already an undergrad. That's wow. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. You were doing a lot more than me. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I was yeah. Six. I don't even know what grade that is. I feel like I have to get fitted for a will one of these days. They were talking about that with us in class, about making wills. And then I tried to make one, and then I was like, no, this is depressing, so I stopped. Well, you have to at some point, you know? So (laughs) at the end of every life, there is death. Yep. Uh, But you'll learn that next year. (laughs) (laughs) Just just give it a couple of years. Yeah, that's that's more PhD level stuff. (laughs) That's when they really prepare you for the wills. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) But this movie, Eight Mile, like uh, it was such a powerful movie, especially toward the end, because like it's a it's freestyle rap. That's all the movie's about, 
And toward the end, like Eminem is killing it, obviously, rapping against all these other rappers. Um, and you think that at the end, like you're expecting there to be a battle, but actually there isn't a battle. So Eminem gets the mic first against this guy. He's Papa Doc is his rapper name. <laughs> and Eminem actually makes all of the points that Papa Doc would have had to make against him. So at mm -hmm. this point in the movie, you haven't seen it yet, but at this point in the movie, there's like, you know, uh, that particular team, that group, Papa Doc's group, like had sex with his girlfriend already. Oh, hell already. no. <laughs> already beat up some of his friends there was another friend who shot himself in the leg so because of an altercation so like Eminem understood that in order to win a war of words mm -hmm. it isn't enough to say negative things about your opposition mm -hmm. but rather say all of the negative things that your opposition would have to say about you mm -hmm. and then what happened was Papa Doc got the mic had nothing to say because every point that he mm -hmm. would have made Eminem has already made about himself mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I thought that to be a very powerful um, metaphor, I guess, of how you can win arguments without necessarily trying to win arguments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, furthermore, I think what's even more important is just the idea that whatever you believe, and you may believe it strongly, and I hope you do, um, mm -hmm. there's an opposition to you that is just as strong. You mm -hmm. might know this person, you might not know that person, but there's an opposition to you that might be just as strong. Lexi and I went to McCall recently, mm -hmm. and there was a guy with some <laughs> questionable signs, let's yeah. say, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's say uh, anti-certain group signs that were right, <laughs> yeah, really, absolutely. really public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a conversation with mm -hmm. the guy, um, and he was, I mean, do you want to take over? Like, yeah, he, he, I, mean, I mean, so I'll be honest here. I think being transparent, especially... You know with others is super important so for me on one hand i like one of my i think strengths and also weaknesses is like when i get like aggravated or just i i feel emotion very deeply and so when i saw these signs i was like hell no like i do not want to talk to this guy like you know there's just he wasn't the signs were like pretty offensive and um you know, so to my surprise, you know, Nafis, you know, goes up and just starts talking to him. And honestly, like, I was pretty taken back by that because, I mean, I, I perceive that to be extremely offensive, um, not only to Nafis, but maybe others that he knows. And, um, you know, he would just talk to him and was kind. And um, I think there's a lot of, like, beauty in being able to do something like that. Um, to not take things so personally, which is something I personally struggle with and I'm growing in, but um, to be able to hear people out and to hear their stories and listen. Um, and yeah, that was just something that kind of like will always like stand out to me because I personally wasn't able, wasn't able to do that. But by Nifis going up and, and talking to this man, like, you know, he probably opened, opened some doors, possibly even, you know, um, combated some maybe preconceived notions or ideas that uh, this man had of Nafis um, or myself or, you know, whoever. Um, and so I think just being able to have an open mind and heart when talking with other people is, it's a difficult thing, especially right now. But I think it's incredibly important. And I'd love to hear like Nafis what that experience was like for you, just going and talking to this guy and yeah. um, like what you were feeling internally, externally, like I'm, I am very curious. Yeah, well internally, I mean, I, I, my understanding of humanity is that it, it's very different from the movies that you see. So in movies, like bad guys know they're the bad guys. You yes, know what I mean? Yes. But in reality, even the worst kinds of people will see the hero in their actions. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll believe that they're doing everything for good, yeah. um, even if they're doing everything for evil. Yeah. So, you know, I, I tend to approach people with that particular mindset. And something must have happened to this guy uh, by, I mean, he was holding up anti-Muslim signs, right? Yeah. So, like, honestly, yeah. you can't. Like, I look Muslim, so there's no way to... <laughs> um, so, you know, he you know he was holding up those signs. I mean, I wasn't 
like upset by it, but I, I just came to the understanding that he wasn't born with hate. In fact, we know for a fact that you cannot be born with hate. The only thing mm -hmm. that you're born fearing is height, I believe. Like you're uh, born elevation. fearing yeah, height. Yeah. Interesting. So you definitely don't want to fall. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, hatred toward any other groups of people or group of people. That's just not a thing when you're born. So something must have happened in this guy's life at some point that, you know, he just had a heart full of hatred toward a particular uh, group. And I also have like a really great quote from mm. Nelson Mandela that is something that I've always like tried to keep, keep with me. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to this very thing. Um, Nelson Mandela, if you don't know, he um, is, was the president of South Africa. He fought apartheid. Um, <laughs> anyways, Nelson Mandela is amazing. And um, one of my favorite quotes is, no one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes much more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. It's true. Yeah. I mean, and I approached this guy with love just because of the fact that I know that he saw himself as the hero. And it is true. Babies, like if you, if you spend any time with them, they always give anyone and every, anything the benefit of the doubt unless like, they've been taught to mm -hmm. do otherwise. And of course, like when they get finicky, they'll want mom and dad, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, when they're comfortable, they're explorers. They're curious. They, mm -hmm. want, they want to believe that everything is good. Um, mm -hmm. they haven't done, you know, fortunately they haven't yet realized that not everything is good, but you know, that's their belief at the time. But, you know, having this conversation with this guy, I mean, he was pretty funny. He, like, he was talking about how he had to use the bathroom <laughs> yeah. and like, and how God was just like <laughs> yeah. absorbing. And right. It was just very interesting. So he'd been standing for like a good hours. Yeah. Like 12 hours. The whole hours. day probably. Yeah. I yeah. know. Yeah. We walked past him probably three or four times yeah. and he just was there every time. Was, yeah. Yeah. And he was standing and he was saying that he hadn't been using the bathroom this whole time. And he just said like, you know, God was using the bathroom for him or something like that. <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know, which, I mean, I, I, it was, it was funny, but like we had a laugh about it, but we still had a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And I think like he knew obviously, but it's one of those things that don't need to be said. I think that's one of the biggest issues uh, when, when it comes to, you know, when you see something that you don't like, you're compelled to speak out against it. Yeah. But what if instead of speaking out against it, you try to speak to the person and mm -hmm. try to understand where they were coming from and make their arguments for them? You know, like what if you asked them and what if I asked that guy, which I sort of did, like what? Well, actually, no, I didn't because like, you know, we were mm -hmm. just kind of enjoying ourselves. Yeah. We <laughs> but like if there's sort of more, more of a professional environment, I would mm -hmm. have asked like, so... Help me understand why. Why is it that you have hate towards this group? Mm -hmm. Not because I want to... I want to Yeah, but because maybe you have a good point. Maybe these people should be hated. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like if you, can, if you can start an argument or a conversation, I should say, if you can start a conversation showing that you're not someone's opposition but rather on their side and just trying to understand where they're coming from, mm -hmm. It's possible that their argument may fall apart in front of their own eyes. Mm. Or it may be. Now, you, don't, you never want to pretend like you know everything, right? So, um, in fact, the more you learn, the more you realize you know nothing yes, at all. Yes, exactly. So, it's the smartest person who says, this, you know, I don't know. Know anything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, maybe this guy, random dude, standing for, and not using the bathroom for 12 hours... <laughs> He's got life all figured out and maybe mm -hmm. these people should be hated and those people should be loved and maybe he has such a compelling argument that I and, or, or anybody else can be, you know, swayed in that direction. In which case, I'd still want to have that information. Mm -hmm. because I'd, if it's that I powerful. would just be curious to understand the why um, to understand where these, you know, ideas came from and, you know, these ideologies. Like, I think there's just a lot to be said once we can get past that emotional, like... You know, oh shit, I'm, I'm angry right yeah. now. Like, this is, this is upsetting me. If we can get past that and be able to, you know, really engage with the humanity that we have in ourselves as yeah. well as the other person, I guarantee that, like, 10 times out of 10 is going to see more results for better, for love, for um, kindness, just everything if we're able to, um, you know, see that part in another person, however small. 
Yeah. I mean, I've worked with um, clients before in the past who there were some aspects of them. I was like, ooh, I am not going to like you. You know, like I strongly disagree with, you know, something about them. But what's crazy, you know, the more you get to know somebody and you see what people have been through, whether that be, you know, not as an excuse, right? But, you know, the trauma they've been through, the hurt, the abuse, the neglect. Once you begin to see those things in other people and hear people's stories, you, you begin to understand why people are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I don't know, I feel like it really evokes a greater compassion um, for others because none of us are perfect. We want to think we are. We want to think we know all the right things. We want to think we're the smartest people in the world with all the right answers, but we're not. And I think... I think that's where like education plays such a big role is that, you know, people who are truly educated are not concerned with, you know, showing people that they are necessarily. Mm. Um, it's like, uh, it's the old analogy is like new money versus old money, right? <laughs> new money always tries to make themselves look richer than they are. Mm -hmm. Old money always tries to make themselves look poorer than they are. So mm -hmm. this way nobody's going to ask for that money. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right so so it's the same thing mm -hmm. with education is that you know there's there's something called the dunning kruger effect where um when you first start to learn something you get confident quicker than you get competent mm -hmm. so lexi recently learned how to one wheel and we were talking about it's, the not, a unicycle, okay? <laughs> it's not a unicycle okay <laughs> i figured this out yeah, real so quick <laughs> google this obviously when you can but the one wheel is not a one wheel <laughs> <laughs> it's way better. Yeah. It's the greatest. So there's a difference between the one wheel and a <laughs> the one, one wheel. wheel. <laughs> so it's not a unicycle, but <laughs> Lexi recently learned how to do that. And, you know, when she first started, she was picking it up very, very quickly. And I asked her while, while I was teaching her to, to be aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that she's going to get more confident than she will competent and you know obviously that that's something to be aware of so essentially what happens is that when you know let's say 10 15 percent of a particular topic or an mm -hmm. activity or a skill mm -hmm. you get so confident that you think you know 90 percent of it <laughs> it's true right and then you try to do certain things do certain tricks and you know I, you know no one's like impervious to mm -hmm. it right you know even when you're when i was learning how to one wheel i was very much aware of the dunning kruger effect Yet I took a disgusting spill to the point where my, my uh, plastic surgeon still says I should get skin grafted, <laughs> oh, right? So, um, which I'm not, you know, it's, it's not that bad. But um, I think he just wants to make some money. But, probably. Uh, he yeah. probably knows. Yeah. It's a rough time. Yeah, exactly. Right <laughs> yeah. Some COVID plastic surgery so going on. <laughs> But, um, but even when you're aware of it, it, it's going to happen. So essentially what happened was that I learned how to, uh, how to one wheel pretty well. And then I was like, oh, I've got enough of it. But I was like, oh, Dunning-Kruger, Dunning-Kruger. I want to get it out of the way quickly. So I hit about like 18, 19 miles an hour, took a huge spill, really hurt myself. I don't know how I didn't get a concussion. But then I got up pretty satisfied, bloodied. And people just around me looking at me like, why are you smiling? You just got hurt. There's definitely something wrong with you. But I was smiling, not because I wasn't in pain, because I was kind of crying a little bit. <laughs> One eye was crying, the other eye was, I was smiling. smiling. Yeah, You're I don't smiling, know tears of joy. But I was smiling because <laughs> I knew that I had finally hit that Dunning-Kruger effect peak where confidence all of a sudden is going to spike downward. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is that once you actually take that spill, and usually, you know, if you're not learning a skill, it won't be a spill. It'll be something embarrassing. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you just start getting into the topic of politics, let's say, and then all of a sudden you think you know it Everything. all, and then you're like, you make an embarrassing statement and someone calls you out and it's like, oh, oh, man. <laughs> like, I guess I know nothing, <laughs> <Yeah. by>. <laughs> Exactly. And then you, your confidence decreases, but then as your confidence decreases, your competence increases. And the way that it works is that when you reach peak levels of competence, meaning that you know as much, you are an expert in a particular field, you know so much competence-wise that you lack almost any level of confidence because you realize mm -hmm. that, like if we were to take the one wheel, for example, it's one wheel. 
so there's only one point of contact with the ground. Yeah. There is no doubt in my mind that I will take maybe a worse spill than that, even though I know how to do it well, because mm -hmm. I might hit a rock. I'm like, if the tire pops, there's only one <laughs> yeah, tire, but, right? I'm yeah. flying off, mm -hmm. you know? So like, this might be the first and last podcast that I do because I might not make it. <laughs> oh. but, but like, you know that it's coming. And that's mm -hmm. why when I ride now, I ride with a lack of confidence yet I'm competent enough to do carves and tricks mm. and stuff like that. Now, the same goes for education or learning in, uh, you know, anything, uh, any new information, is that once you start learning about the topic of physics or something like that, right? So when you learn a little bit about physics, you think you know all Everything, about physics. Yeah. And then you have an embarrassing conversation with an actual physicist. <laughs> with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right, exactly. <laughs> then and he's then, like, hell no. Yeah, <laughs> and then you realize you know nothing at all. So then you're inspired to learn more and more. Yet when you learn more and more, you realize that how much there is left to learn. Mm -hmm. And how much humanity hasn't even yet learned. So once you get to the point where you've reached um, optimal levels of competence and intelligence and just knowing everything that's go that, that is already known about a particular topic. Now you're, an, you're at an advantage because you are indeed an expert in the field, but you're also at a disadvantage because unlike the layman, unlike the, the ignorant layman, let's say, who thinks that there is a, you know, the, the, the amount of information that needs to be collected mm -hmm. in this particular arena is complete, you know better. And that can be a frightening, frightening thing, mm -hmm. is that you might be 23 years old, 36 years old, you might be an expert in a particular field, so much so that you're leading in that particular industry, and then you're like, this is it? Mm -hmm. Like, there's so much left, we don't know anything. And that's the, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect in a nutshell. Um, and it, you know, tails back to the whole empowering the opposition thing, because what do we know? Mm. Like, right, the more and how do we know what we know? Yeah, exactly. And just mm -hmm. the way that we accumulate knowledge, it may be different from the ways that other people do. Um, you know, some of the topics that we were going to be talking about, like, for example, we're going to talk, be talking about intelligence, different mm -hmm. kinds of intelligence. Yeah. We'll have a longer, you know, uh, uh, podcast about that in the future. But just quickly talk about, like when we went to Quinn's Pond the other day, yeah. and there were two ladies who just, you know, figured something out that mm -hmm. we couldn't. Um, yeah, so I think a great example of this, the other day, um, Nafis and I and some of my friends, we were um, on um, Quinn's Pond, and we were just paddleboarding. And we, <laughs> this like goes to show the different types of intelligence, okay? So it was really windy that day, and we were just like paddling um, on the paddle boards. But then like the wind would push us back to shore really fast. Meanwhile, there's this buoy that is stationary, obviously not moving anywhere. And we probably like paddle past this thing multiple we times. We hit it a couple times. We right? hit it a couple <laughs> yeah. times. Like we hit it. And then like towards the end of the day, these two ladies had like tied themselves to this buoy and they're like, Oh yeah, like look what you know, it's we're not going anywhere. <laughs> like and we're and if and I were just like, Oh my gosh, like and we think we're smart sometimes. Yeah. You know, yeah. like that is why I think there's so many different aspects of um, you know, intelligence and we'll get more into it later, but like, you know, you have emotional intelligence, you have you know, like analytical intelligence. You have people who are great with numbers, right? Great with dates. You have people who have a photographic memory. Um, you know, maybe are, maybe some people are like really great with faces. Others, you know, maybe they're really great at, you know, geometry, art. Like there's just so many different types of, um, you know, intelligence. <laughs> And, you know, you can be really strong in one area and, you know, maybe not so strong in another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I had this whole discussion the other day with Nufis about this, but just about standardized tests. I've never been a standardized test person. Um, to this day, I'm pissed I wasn't in gifted and talented. <laughs> Yet you're going to get your PhD. <laughs> I I'm like, if y'all know what gifted and talented was and you were in it, I'm talking to you. Because... <laughs> no. Um, but I just I was never really good at standardized tests. Um, got like the most average score twice on my SAT. Um, but at every point in my life, I have gotten better, like GPA wise, like 
um, just grade wise, whether, you know, from high school to college to graduate, you know, graduate school. And so just understanding, yeah, standardized tests are great, but how, how does that measure the other types of intelligence? What about grit? What about determination? Um, I mean, do we even have a measure for, you know, emotional intelligence? What does that look like? How it just raises so many questions. And I think whenever I use the word smart or brilliant, like, what is that? What does that mean to me? Yeah. I mean, it's it also matters when you peak, and sometimes we we peak early because we're complacent, right? So, like, if you are the I don't know, like uh, in the gifted and talented <laughs> program, let's say, you might say to yourself, "I'm in the gifted and talented Johnson. program, so I don't need to do anything more," you know. And then you see all of your friends pass you by, so it it really like it, it matters how you peak and when you peak and mm. quite often like think about michael jordan right so he got cut from i think his his junior year or sophomore year in high school or he was in jv or something mm -hmm. like that we're talking about michael yeah. jordan yeah. and he was not you know he was not included in the highest level of basketball in his high school program at the time and the reason why is because he just wasn't good enough at the time. Seems mm. like I'm clearly I'm not Michael Jordan, but like <laughs> sort of like an analogy would be I was rejected from uh, uh, Rutgers, for example, one one school one school that rejected me as a student. I was rejected as a student, and then a few years later they asked me to come teach for the same program that I was rejected for. And then I asked them, like, do you remember? Like, and they're like, yes, we remember. Your social security is still the same. You're, still you're not covert. They're like, we're sorry. We yeah. regret it. Like, right. Well, they weren't actually. Because, they like, weren't yeah, sorry. They, because they, first of all, they were like, yeah, we know. We probably know more about you than you know you about know yourself. Because we're going to vet our professors. We're not yeah. going to have some Looney Tunes guy standing in front of these MSW students. But their point was, and I remember perfectly, I was like, you were not ready back then, mm. right? A few years ago, you were yeah. not even good enough to be a student with us. Now you are good enough to be a professor with us. Wow. And it's the idea that, yeah, if I were to look back on the, the way that I wrote back then and, the, and like the lack of sophistication in my, mm -hmm. in my thought, yeah, I don't think I was Rutgers quality at the time. But... Getting rejected meant that, like, I had to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. You and get a see... little hit to the ego. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So if I was accepted as a student at Rutgers, is it safe to say that I might not never have become a professor at Rutgers? Right, maybe sometimes you fail at lesser goals because bigger things are what you were meant to accomplish. Mm. And you might not be able to accomplish those bigger things yeah. if you're successful at lesser things. Because being successful with lesser things makes you complacent. And I think a lot of people, you know, who are successful in any field, you know, that they excel in, right? I think they would say that some of their most impactful moments in life, um, the moments that really change the trajectory of their life, um, or really, you know, push them forward and propel them to be the greatest version of themselves in whatever facet that is, was those failures, was those setbacks, um, because it forces you to reconvene, work harder, um, think outside of the box. And honestly, I mean, I don't know about you, Nafis, but I see it as a challenge. Like whenever I've ever failed at something or like didn't make a team or, you know, didn't get whatever goal I had, I always saw it as a challenge, not necessarily towards or against other people, but with myself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the most satisfying things in, in the world is to just be like, you know, I've got, I worked so hard, I was rejected, at whatever this was, and then here I am now, and, and I've beaten who I was back yeah. then, you know? And that, that's such a great feeling, I yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but I do believe that, like, everything happens for a reason. And at the time of its happening, you don't understand the greater reason mm. behind it. Yeah. Like, let's say, injuries that you might have experienced or rejection letters or failures. Mm -hmm. You're not making it into the gifted and talented program. <laughs> Right. Um, and now you're going to get your doctorate degree and be one of the elite scholars in, in human history, technically. Right. So like, you know, you're you're made for greater things. And when bad things happen to us, we don't we don't understand how it 
equates to better things. Actually, my dad always says this too. If you look back on your life retrospectively, has anything bad ever happened to you? Relationships didn't work out, you know, mm -hmm. the different careers didn't work out. But ultimately, would you be where you're at right now had it not been for those lessons mm -hmm. from failure? Yeah. So like if, if for, I don't know about other people necessarily, but for me, I can sort of confidently say that nothing truly bad has ever happened to me mm -hmm. because anything bad at the time has been a lesson that I've Later been able to on. use. Right, yeah. exactly. I think just as humans, we are pain averters. We do not like to experience pain in the moment. Like it's horrible. You know, it's just not a good feeling, right? But, you know, really when we take and examine our lives or the experiences we had, like I am thankful for every, every painful experience, every um, setback in life or, you know, when my life didn't, you know, pan out the way I thought it was going to, or I didn't make this team or that, you know, whatever it was, because I was able to really experience those higher moments, those um, successful moments, and with a whole new gratitude and just understanding, like how boring, truly, how boring would life be if we succeeded at everything? Like if we didn't have the um, contrast of failure, would success really mean much to us? It wouldn't mean much at all because, I mean, I sort of liken it to breathing, right? The only time we acknowledge and celebrate <laughs> breathing is when we're actually talking about like right now. You're probably listening in saying, oh, yeah, I am breathing. I totally <laughs> forgot. I've been breathing the whole day. Or when you're drowning. Right, well, exactly. When, <laughs> you're you, like... when, you, when it's absent, right? So yeah. that's the thing with success. You know, the drowning example is the perfect example yeah. because... You know, just like with success, you only acknowledge success in relation or relativity to lack of success or mm -hmm. failure. Same thing with breathing. You only realize that you breathe when you don't get to breathe anymore, mm -hmm. like when you're drowning or when you're actually prompted <laughs> to think about it for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, success means nothing without failure and failure, failure means nothing without success. And it's just like, you know, how you use and how you overcome those failures. There are some who would certainly, you know, crumble under the pressure and think to themselves and get down on themselves. Mm -hmm. So by no means are any two people made the same, mm -hmm. right? So like I've, uh, for whatever reason, you know, in coaching and things like that, I've always responded best to coaches who were very negative with me. Mm, yeah. So I've like, I've had some really good coaches. And I've been pretty successful. So obviously, you know, many coaches have, have said good things about me. But one coach I love, Coach Parrotsman over in Port Richmond High School in Staten Island, he would always tell me, like, you know, I don't know why you're more scholar than athlete, because I would always, like, three years <laughs> in a row, we've won the Scholastic Athlete Award. He would say, like, you're just, not, you're just a scholar, like, you know. I just I did you know. semi-pro NFL, okay? <laughs> right, exactly. Just, just so, saying that, throwing that in there. <laughs> so, like, you know, but he would, like, he knew I was good, and everybody knew I was good. Mm -hmm. But he would challenge me in a very particular kind of way by saying, like, you're slow, you're weak, you're not going get, to get anywhere, you're just, I don't know why you're playing football. But, like, the other coaches would be like, why is he saying that? <laughs> like, you know, other guys who's like... But the way that Coach Parrotsman spoke with some of my other teammates were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So Parrotsman, Coach Parrotsman, like, knew how to tailor conversations based on who he was talking mm -hmm. to. He might be one of the best psychologists I've ever known, and he <laughs> never took a psychology class, I'm sure. But, like, it's, it's, it's the understanding that different people will respond differently to different stimuli. Mm -hmm. Me, like, obviously, don't be mean to me for no <laughs> reason, right? <laughs> I'm not asking hearts. for that. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, like, you know, if there's anything that I want to get better at, I want to know what areas I need to be, mm, I need to yeah. get better at as opposed to where am I already good. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's different when it comes to like 10-year promotion, I'm trying to get paid, <laughs> then I'm trying to showcase all the good things that I yeah. do. But if I'm actually trying to grow without some kind of ulterior motive, and let's not pretend like ulter ulterior motives don't exist. I just started as an assistant professor mm -hmm. with BSU, and obviously, it's in my best interest to put forth the best persona possible mm -hmm. so that I can reach 10-year mm -hmm. full professor hopefully someday we all have ulterior motives yeah like exactly. whatever you know whatever it is like yeah we have to acknowledge that. yeah and but ultimately like what i want to do is i want to be the best educator possible 
So like I, I would love it when students come and tell me like this is something that you could have done better or sometimes like, you know, I'm big on like, you know, intellectual diversity, mm -hmm. trying to shun any kind of like, you know, intellectual intellectual uniformity. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, my values will pop up and a student will come up and say like, I think like, like it was way too obvious that you fell on this particular side of the topic, mm -hmm. which is great because mm -hmm. now next year when I teach or next semester when I teach this course again, I'll be more aware of that because like I don't teach to get students to think the way that I think like mm -hmm. that's not I'm like I'm not trying to build a whole bunch of followers I'm trying to build mm -hmm. new leaders for the world um, you know and like ultimately if one of my students one day becomes like a dean of mine or a chair of mine that's the ultimate success, success in my opinion mm -hmm. I think um, that really another really like good point to that too is just kind of seeing how um, like diversity of thought and like I won't go in depth here but just like how if you look at you know when people try to recruit for religion for example we're kind of doing that same thing with um, not only like politics right it's you're in this one you're in this group or you're in this group same with um, you know a lot of a lot of times in like university settings right um, when you're looking at different ideologies that are pushed in class, like you're on this side or you're on this side, you know, it's, it kind of has this like, um, recruitment mentality. Mm -hmm. It has this, you know, you're on this side or you're wrong or you're evil or you're horrible or you're bad. Um, and that's just kind of something that like Nafisa and I want to like dispel and continue to just talk about and normalize and truly make a safe, like, Place and podcast to just stir interesting intellectual discussions. Yeah, and the idea here is just to battle groupthink. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we, you know, hopefully this podcast grows and we have guests and we have listeners and, and people that interact with us on social media and things like that. We just want to create an environment where we can begin conversations. We, we're not trying to end conversations. We're not trying to say, well, this is the final answer. Mm -hmm. um, quite the contrary, <laughs> in fact. We're trying to show that there's more than one answer to every question. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the person um, and mm -hmm. just the values that they have and the upbringing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's that's essentially what we're trying to do with this with this podcast. Yeah, and I think as well as this podcast grows, um, I think it would be love to get, or we would love to get suggestions about different topics um, that you guys would like to hear about um, and you know have discussed. I just think right now it's hard to have some of these conversations without things turning very emotional or political or religious or you know whatever. Um, and so it's just great to be able to talk about some of these things just openly and and hear both sides to arguments um, and just really come at some of these conversations just with an openness to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, I think a lot of people talk a big game and I've had plenty of professors talk, <laughs> yeah. talk this kind of a big game too. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples as far as like how open we are. Like we're happy to entertain the idea of a flat earth <laughs> type of argument if that's what like you know mm -hmm. like clearly Lexi and I don't believe in it but we mm -hmm. like what what would the what would it mean to empower the opposition those who mm -hmm. believe that the earth is flat what ground <laughs> so funny right what, <laughs> what ground, ground would they have to stand on and like it could very well be that they're going off their own data set and the data that mm -hmm. they've collected which we were talking about just before mm -hmm. before we had record about how like, well, based on their experiences, whenever they look forward, all they see is a straight line. They don't see the curvature of the mm -hmm. earth, which is actually trial and error. And the way that, you know, that is a scientific uh, approach. And because they haven't been proven, uh, well, the fact or the idea, I should say, the idea that the earth is round hasn't been proven to them means that they will hold on to the null hypothesis, let's say, of uh, believing that the earth is flat. And there's plenty of like understanding there as far as why someone would think that the earth is flat. I mean, let's, for a greater majority of human history, people have thought that the earth is mm -hmm. flat. It's only a newer idea that the earth is, 
you know, the earth is round or spherical or, you know, not exactly spherical, <laughs> but, but sort of. We're also open to having arguments about, like, you know, just the difference in what, what does the Bernie Sanders camp have that, you know, that the Trump camp doesn't have and no vice, and vice versa, versa right? yeah. so and yeah. aliens and just really right, anything exactly. anything um that would just be you know interesting to discuss yeah and, so I, we're trying to not just do it lip service here because there, there's literally no professor that i have had that has said that no no like we're, we're totally like against you know the diversity of the everyone says says that it are. yes but like until yeah. you actually right talk about exactly. it and discuss it and and I think in some ways you know for example like with the flat earthers right personally I don't believe in this at all for many reasons but um, what's interesting though for me is that these people are told something their entire life right that the earth is this way it's this way you know but they actually had the ability to question is it really that way which I think is actually a strength in one way, not just obviously looking at the earth, but other things, right? Is what we've been taught, what we have been shown on the media or um, taught in schools or whatever, how accurate is that? What, how many things have we taken you know, for granted or have just never questioned that we could question? Yeah. I think just having the ability to question something is you know, incredibly useful and, mm -hmm. And we should be able to do that freely without, you know, fear of being attacked yeah. or ostracized. And quite honestly, I mean, 2020, it takes a lot of courage yeah. to say, I believe the earth is flat. <laughs> a lot. You know, <laughs> so like there, there's something there and people who say that aren't saying it just to look stupid. Obviously, nobody wants to look stupid, but there's something there. And they have conventions they like... Yeah. You know, there there are quite a bit of people who believe in this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we do want to create an environment where we are intentionally empowering the opposition. Now, calling it intentionally empowering the opposition is way too long of a title. <laughs> but, like, you know, the idea that we, Lexi and I had, and, and calling it empowering the opposition, is that whenever we have, like, lulls and, and conversation, we try to defer to the idea of what have we been talking about? What perspective have we been taking? Mm -hmm. And now let's take the opposing perspective with the same degree of strength and conviction. Mm -hmm. So we've made this point for two, three, four, five, maybe 10 minutes. I can't imagine going t 10 minutes on one particular point mm -hmm. necessarily. But now let's spend, a, you know, maybe not the same amount of time, but the same amount of energy mm -hmm. trying to argue to oppose the point that we agree with, let's mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Um, and I think like it's important to do because you don't understand your own argument until you understand the credibility and the validity of your opposition. Mm -hmm. So if you think that you are so right in what you believe that there is no opposition to what you're saying, it means that you don't quite understand what you're saying at this time because you think that that's the only thing that can be said. So, you know, it's just a, an idea. We'll see how it goes. We mm -hmm. think, uh, we think we'll, we'll, we'll do okay. Uh, we just worked <laughs> on a little bit of art here and like... It's amazing. You know, naming, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see where it goes. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Dr. Nafi Salam. And I'm Lexi Wilson. And this has been Empowering the Opposition. See you next time. <laughs>